Hello, and welcome to our pre-lab activity associated with the female reproductive system. So the first organ we're going to take a look at uh, with the female reproductive system is going to be the ovary. And so if you take a look at the low magnification view of the ovary, what you're going to see is an outer cortex region where we're going to find the oocyte containing ovarian follicles. Uh, so you have a, a lot of circular profiles uh, with the oocyte in them surrounded by the ovarian follicular cells. And then deeper to that, uh, we're going to have a medulla. Uh, and this is going to be, depending upon the stage of the ovary, uh, a relatively small structure, uh, which is going to be without the ovarian follicles. Or we're going to have a, a very rich vascular uh, stroma uh, supporting meshwork. We're going to focus in primarily on the ovarian follicles. And this is going to be the structure which is going to be involved with producing the ova, producing the egg, uh, that's going to be released by the ovary and hopefully in the process of reproduction uh, be fertilized. Uh, so it's going to be involved with uh, the development of the ova as well as a hormone secreting structure because it can be involved with production of estrogen. And so when we take a look at an ovarian follicle, what we're going to see is a single oocyte, and so we're going to see uh, an enlarged cell with uh, a fairly euchromatic appearing nucleus, distinct nucleolus, surrounded by uh, what are referred to as either follicular cells or granulosa cells. So much smaller, uh, more um, uh, basophilic staining cells, which are going to be immediately surrounding and supporting uh, the egg as it's developing, supporting the ova as it's developing. Now, if we take a look at this, uh, the majority of the ovarian follicles are going to be referred to as primordial ovarian follicles, and they're going to be an inactive or resting phase. And so what we're going to see is a, a relatively large uh, oocyte. This is going to be a primary oocyte. In this case, we can see uh, it's, it's distinct uh, euchromatic nucleus with a very prominent nucleolus, but a very, very large cell. And that primary oocyte is going to be surrounded by a single layer of follicular cells. And in the primordial or resting ovarian follicle, these follicular cells are going to be a squamous. So they're going to be relatively flat. So they're there, they're able to respond, but they're going to be inactive in this inactive primordial follicle. Now in response to follicle stimulating hormone released by the pituitary, some of these primordial follicles are going to develop into primary ovarian follicles. And so they're going to undergo some growth and development. So again, we still got the oocyte that's going to be present. So large cell, very euchromatic nucleus, surrounded by, now in this case, these follicular cells have started to respond. And so they're not the kind of flat and squamous cells we've seen before. We start to see multiple layers. Uh, they're going to be either round or cuboidal in appearance. Uh, but that's going to be a, a very uh, predominant change uh, as we go into the ovarian follicle development. These follicular cells are going to become larger and uh, start to produce more and more of these cells. Where we're going to see uh, the presence of a zona pellucida. This is going to be a glycoprotein rich layer uh, kind of immediately surrounding uh, the ova as it's developing. Now these follicular cells may be uh, involved with production of liquor folliculi at this stage it's very early on in development. So they haven't produced liquor folliculi, liquor fluid uh, follicle uh, folliculi follicle. So the fluid of the follicle uh, is going to start to be produced by these follicular cells. We don't see it at this early stage. And then outside of the ovarian follicle itself, we're going to have the connective tissue, which is going to be referred to as the theca folliculi. And we're going to have specialized connective tissue cells in here that are going to differentiate into a steroid hormone secreting structure. Now, as we get to further develop, in this case, we've got a secondary ovarian follicle. Uh, again, we've got the oocyte, the very uh, pink staining zone of pellucid around it, lots and lots of follicular cells around it. We've got an antrum, which is this liqueur folliculi coalescing into a large uh, cavity. And then we've got the theca. And so we've got the, the theca interna, immediately underlying the follicular cells, and then the theca externa, which is going to be mainly uh, connective tissue cells. But again, it's specialization immediately surrounding the ovarian follicle. Now, the mature or graphene follicle is going to become independent. Uh, it's uh, essentially going to become FSH independent. Uh, it's going to be very large and it's going to form immediately prior to ovulation. And so if we take a look at this, this is a, a higher magnification view of this, this region of the, the image to the top. Still got the oocyte here. Got the very rich uh, zona pellucida, very prominent surrounding it. We're going to have a single layer of ovarian follicular cells. Um, 
which are going to form the corona radiata uh, that are going to be ovulated with the egg. And then we're going to have the other uh, follicular cells around it. But they're going to have a, a cluster of cells called the cumulus oophorus, which is going to be a pedestal, which is going to keep the egg, uh, the ova, and the uh, corona radia anchored to it so it's not floating around free uh, within the antrum itself. Now, the majority of follicles aren't going to develop to that mature agrophian stage and result in ovulation of an egg. Uh, majority of the follicles are going to become atritic at some stage. They may be uh, at the primordial, the primary, secondary. But basically, the ones that aren't ovulated, uh, the structures that don't produce an, an ovulated egg, are going to become atritic. And so they're going to be degenerating through the process of autolysis. So it's essentially going to be a programmed cell death uh, where essentially we're going to have kind of a wavy scar formation form. So they're going to look very disorganized, very disruptive, and over time they're going to be minimized by the activity of macrophages and leave a little bit of a scar present within the ovarian cortex. Now after ovulation, what's left behind are going to be the follicular cells and those theca cells, and they're going to give you this kind of, uh, kind of woven, kind of back and forth, kind of twisted around structure which is going to be the corpus luteum, a temporary endocrine structure involved with both the production of estrogen and progesterone. If we look at this at higher magnification, this is looking at one of those little folds, we're going to have the granulosa luteum cells, the cells that are derived from the granulosa or follicular cells. They're going to be involved with uh, secretion of progesterone, and these are going to be larger, paler staining cells. The kind of smaller, darker staining cells are derived from the theca interna. And these cells are going to be involved with the production and secretion of estrogen. Once the egg is released, it's going to be transported through the oviducts. And so it's essentially the oviducts are going to be a structure between the ovary and the uterus. They're going to capture uh, the released ova and they're going to transport it down to the uterus. And it's going to take a, you know, an extended period of time to transport it through the uterus. I'm sorry, through the oviducts to the uterus. And it's going to be within the uterine tubes where we're going to find uh, that the ovum is going to be fertilized. So the egg and the sperm are coming together uh, within the oviducts. When we take a look at the uterine tubes, the oviducts, uh, we're going to start out with a, a highly folded, very complex structure of mucosal folds within the infundibulum. As we go through the oviducts, it's going to become much less folded and a much smaller lumen as it's going through. We take a look at the lining cells uh, of the uterine tubes. We're going to have ciliated columnar cells, and again, cilia like we've seen before, capable of beating and propelling things, in this case the egg, uh, along its journey through the uterine tubes. We're also going to have uh, these shorter mucus secreting PEG cells, which are going to be producing a bacterial, um, essentially a film that blocks bacterial access to the peritoneal cavity. So you have this kind of undulating surface because you have the taller ciliated cells, the shorter PEG cells. Uh, which are going to be lining uh, the epithelial lining, lining the mucosa within the uterine tubes. Ultimately, the egg is going to be delivered into the uterus. And so the uterus is going to be a hollow muscular organ for supporting the development uh, of the embryo and the fetus. And we take a look at it. We're going to have an endometrium, which is going to be that inner lining, which is going to undergo very dramatic changes, uh, cyclical changes. Uh, corresponding to what's going on within the ovary, uh, controlled by hormones. And then we're going to have a deeper, smooth muscle cell layer, which is going to be the myometrium. And that again, the myometrium is going to be able to undergo some changes later on during pregnancy. We take a look at the endometrium mucosa. We're essentially looking at a structure, which is going to be the primary region of the uterus, which is going to receive the embryo the process of implantation, and then it's going to be involved with nourishing and developing that embryo uh, throughout uh, embryonic and fetal development. It's going to be lined by a simple columnar epithelium, and those simple columnar epithelial cells are going to be organized in simple tubular glands. Uh, deeper to the endometrium is going to be the myometrium, the muscle cell layer, and this is going to be the thickest layer of the uterus, and the myometrium is going to be able to undergo hyperplasia and hypertrophy in response to the hormones during pregnancy. So hyperplasia, additional cells, additional smooth muscle cells, and hypertrophy, the cells are going to become larger. And so there is essentially going to be a thickening of the very already thick wall of the uterus uh, to prepare for childbirth. 
uh, later on, the pituitary hormone oxytocin that we've talked about previously, is going to synchronize these uh, smooth muscle cells to allow for the very forceful, very strong myometrial contractions associated with childbirth. If we focus in on what's going on within the uterus, what we're going to see again um, within each uterine cycle or each ovarian cycle is changes occurring within the endometrium. And there are going to be two regions within the endometrium. We're going to have a superficial stratum functionalis or pars functionalis. And this is going to be a temporary layer of the endometrium, which is going to be thickened or shed in response to ovarian hormones. Deeper to that, we're going to have the stratum basale or the pars basalis. It's going to be a thinner layer, deeper layer, a little bit more denser uh, packed cells uh, within this region. And this is going to contain the basal portion of the glands. And essentially, while the stratum functionalis is going to be lost at the end of a uterine cycle, the stratum basalis, this base layer down here, is going to be maintained. And it's going to be the cells from the stratum basalis that are going to regenerate the stratum functionalis with the next uterine cycle. Now, during the proliferative phase of the uterus, what we're going to see is responding to the hormones uh, within the ovarian, uh, phase, the ovarian follicular phase, uh, the ovarian follicles are going to be secreting estrogen. So estrogen is going to stimulate the cells within the endometrium during this proliferative phase to grow out and reestablish that stratum functionalis. So we're going to see establishment of the stratum functionalis and relatively straight glands, these uterine glands being present. After ovulation, we're going to have the luteal phase of the ovary. And corresponding to the luteal phase of the ovary, we're going to have an increase in progesterone. We still have some estrogen present, but the progesterone is going to stimulate these uterine gland cells, these uterine endometrial um, lining cells, to essentially differentiate a little bit further so they can continue to divide. And so the glands are going to start to have kind of a coiled or kind of zigzag appearance to them but they're going to start to secrete glycoproteins. And so the lumens of what used to be kind of a straight, almost like test tubes-like structure, are going to become engorged. We're going to have a coiled appearance, so it's going to zigzag back and forth, giving it almost like a sawtooth appearance. And this is in preparation to receiving the embryo. And so the characteristic of the uterine uh, glands during the secretory phase is that they're being coiled, zigzag, and have enlarged lumens associated with the secretory phase. Now, if implantation doesn't occur, essentially we're not going to have HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, being produced, and the corpus luteum is going to be lost. If the corpus luteum is lost, uh, um, essentially what's going to happen is uh, the progesterone levels are going to decrease, and the decrease in progesterone levels are going to result in the coiled arteries that go up into the stratum functionalis are, in essence, going to become very constricted. We're going to regulate or restrict the blood flow to the stratum functionalis. Now, we got straight arteries going down here into uh, the stratum basale, its base levels down here and into the myometrium. So we got the straight arteries. Their blood flow is not restricted, but the blood flow up here into the stratum uh, functionalis is. Restrict the blood flow, cause ischemia, cause degeneration. So we're going to have loss of the stratum functionalis. When that occurs, essentially, the stratum functionalis is going to be sloughed off, leaving behind the base region, the stratum basale, with those base regions of the glands, which are going to be regenerated in that next phase, in what would be the start of this process all over again, the repeat of the uterine phase. So during the proliferative phase of the uterus and the next uterine phase, these cells would divide and reestablish the stratum functionalis that's been lost at this stage because implantation and pregnancy uh, did not occur. And this finishes up our pre-lab activities associated with the female reproductive system. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me uh, at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.